I have a question for the ladies this morning. Ladies, as you look back on your life, some of you look back a little longer than others. If you could go back and interview an old boyfriend <laughs> that said some things that were not true about himself, what would you ask him? How would you start? I'm not asking what you're going to have in your hands when you do that, but what, what would you think about? I'd like you to think about one question that you could ask him. And it's this question, and we're going to find this later in John chapter 1, who are you? And that's a tough question for us guys, I have to admit, because for the most part, especially the younger that we are, we think we are really, really big stuff. And that simple question, who are you, can solve and possibly eliminate many boyfriends and many heartaches in the process. But let's say for an example, you didn't have that situation. You actually found early in your life an honest young guy. And you asked him that question, who are you? And he said, well, if I'm honest, I, I'd have to say I'm, I'm probably like most guys. There's some things that I wish I didn't do or did as much that I would really like to fix. You know, I don't, I don't have a grip on that yet, but there's some things I'd really like to change. There's some things that I do okay, and there's some things that I do pretty good. But you know, as a whole, I have a lot of work. I'm a work in progress, so that's me. I'm not a superstar. I'm just an average guy. And maybe he would say to you, well, you know, I may not know exactly who I am, but I know who I am not. I can tell you who I am not, and maybe that'll help you in your definition of who I am. So maybe he says to you, you know, I am not Superman. Now, some of your old boyfriends did think they were Superman. But this guy is different. He says, you know, I am not Superman, but I really like helping people. When I see someone who needs help, I, I try to do my best to, you know, to help them. I am not a computer expert. I mean, if your computer breaks down and I touch it, you may not get it back. I'm just not a computer genius. I don't have any shares in Microsoft or Apple, you know, that's just not my thing. But sometimes my head is in the cloud. I just want you to know that. You know, he may say, well, I'm not Hercules. This year I did sign up for a gym membership, but I am definitely not Hercules. So if you're looking for a guy that's really strong, you know, you may need to keep looking. You know, and with all the movies out, I could honestly say I am not Prince Charming. I'm not rich. You know, I have a savings account. There's not any money in it, but I do have the minimum in my savings. So if that's what you're looking for, it's not me. And yes, I, I have to confess, I'm not a great kisser. I've never even kissed a girl before. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that would feel like for you. You might be disappointed. And I'm not a professional athlete. You know, I love to watch ESPN and all these sports, but I am not really coordinated. It's really tough for me to chew gum and walk at the same time. So if I have to be honest with you, you know, if I have to tell you this is who I'm not, at least that helps clarify those things. Now, that would be helpful for many of us. It would be helpful to know who we are not. But it's more important to know who we are. I'll add to that. It's more important to know who God says you are. Because what other people say about you may not necessarily be true. What other people describe as this is who you are may be something, may, it may be something you did in the past that you don't do now. It may be a certain characteristic you had on display for a good part of your life, but it's not who you are today. So this question of who are you is really important. 
Because the way you define that question, the way you answer that question, reflects how you think. Reflects the way you talk. Reflects even the things that you do and the things that you don't do. So, maybe you don't know 100% of who you are, but you know who you are not. But today what we're saying is, it's not so much what other people say, it's not so much even what you say, it's what God says. See, because what God says about you is what matters. What God says about you is the key to your identity, to your eternity, and to the things that you do and the things that you don't do. So last week we looked at this idea of you have life to give life. Today we're going to look at this simple idea, which is this. Who God says I am is what matters. And we know we are not supermen. We know we're not Hercules. We know we're not NBA stars. And those are things that people do, but that's not who they are. You may have a title, but a title is not who you are in this planet. That's what you do. That's maybe what you've accomplished. That's maybe what you're pursuing, but it's not who you are. The Bible talks about this idea of a spiritual identity. And if we can understand this spiritual identity early on this year, it could change everything about our lives in 2015 and beyond. So let's back up a little bit. We talked last week about this book of John. We talked about the four Gospels. But who really is John speaking to? John is not talking to just everybody. He's talking to a group of believers. So when we talk about this idea of spiritual identity, we're talking about a person who has already accepted Christ as their Savior. The Bible says, without God, we are all spiritually lost. But when a person comes, they recognize their need for God. They recognize they are a sinner. They recognize there is nothing I can do to reach God on my own. But Jesus Christ provided payment for my sins. When he died on the cross, he shed his blood. He was buried and risen again on the third day. And when I invite him into my life by faith, I begin a new life, a new journey, a new transformation. So in that one act, I have, you have, we have a new identity. And as long as we live through that identity, we're going to think differently. We're going to do things for the next lifetime, not just for this lifetime. And it's going to change the people that we speak with and see every day. So let's get back to the question, who are you? On the left side of your bulletin, let's take a look at John chapter 1. And I hope you bought the Bible that you purchased. We sold over 100 Bibles during the Christmas break and last week. So I hope you brought your Bible with you. We're going to look at a few passages that are not going to be on the screen. But look here at John 1, starting on verse 19. And it says, And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. Right at the start of this passage, it says, This is the testimony of of John. This is the testimony of John. And with all the recent cases that are in court, some are ongoing, some have already passed, would you say that the word of a testimony, a testimonial, someone giving evidence to what happened is important in a court of law? Yes or no? Yeah, it is. It is. And the more credible the witness, the better the testimony. So John is saying, listen, this is my testimony. 
This is my story. This is what I want you to understand. He's writing to people to help them understand this is what happened. He's not pulling this out of the cloud. He's saying, I was there. This word testimony in the original language is martiria. And it talks about this idea of judicial evidence. And there were a couple things happening during this time in John's gospel. First of all, people were trying to understand when the Messiah would come. People were trying to understand how to identify this Messiah. So as you can imagine, there were false messiahs showing up saying, hey, people, I want you to know, I am the guy. I am the Messiah. Here's my bank account. Just write me a check right here. I promise you'll get a blessing. Send me your handkerchief. Send me. No, they didn't say it like that. But the idea was the same. They were trying to deceive people in saying that they were the Messiah. Now, in Mark chapter 14, this is on the screen, verse 55, here's another angle on the same scenario. It says, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. So later on, they were seeking some judicial evidence. They wanted to burn this guy. They wanted to put him not only in jail, but to death. So they were seeking some kind of legal loophole to do it. And it says, but they found how much? They found none. They found none. For many bore false witnesses against them, but their testimony did not agree. So here's what John is doing. John is telling the people, listen, this is what happened. This is my testimony. This is the story behind what you're going to see and uncover. But here's what John helps us understand as well. The book of John was written so that you and I might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It was written to lift up Christ and point people to him. So this testimony, this spoken word is important. Now, as we look at Mark, what were they looking for? They were looking for a testimony to condemn. Isn't that interesting? John was giving them a testimony to lift up Christ. These guys over here later on were looking for a testimony to condemn. What are we saying? Your story about other people has the opportunity to help someone along or bring someone down. I was on a conference call the other day with two guys in a company, and they were evaluating someone in their company, and I had met this person before, and they asked me my opinion. And they said, Marcel, what do you think about this person? And I said, well, you know, I think they're a very honest person. They do a good job. They're concerned about the company. They're, you know, somewhat intense, and they want to get the job done. And I, I think... I think they're a good fit for your company. I think they, they gel really well with your culture, so I think they would be a great asset to your company. Right after that, the owner of the company said, good, we're going to promote them. So I hung up the phone, and I thought about that for just a minute. I said, wow, there are times where your words and my words will serve to help somebody and there are times when your words and my words will serve to put someone down. What you say and the testimony that you say about other people carries a lot of weight. Carries a lot of weight. If, you don't, if you're not entirely convinced of this, have you ever been offended by something that someone else said even though they were just playing around in the process? Many of us have. So this testimony is a serious thing. And we're going to look at what John says in just a minute. Now, this is not in your bulletin. But if you have your Bible, just turn to John 5, a few chapters up. And I'm going to read this to you. So if you don't have it, it's okay. I want you to think about the testimony of Jesus. Now look what Jesus says. John 5, 34. Just listen. He says, Not that the testimony that I receive is from men, 
But I say these things so that you may be saved. Now he's going to talk about John. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But, here's the but, the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying this. John has given testimony of me. In other words, another man has spoken about me. But even though another man has spoken, the testimony of what God has spoken is greater than the testimony of what man has spoken. There are times when people are marked deep, deep, deep in their heart by what someone else has said about them. What matters is not what someone else has said as much as what God has said about you. Some people go through their lives for years with scars just because dad said this, mom said this, my employer said this, my sister said this, my brother said this, they said this, and they forget what God says about you is what matters. Don't allow someone else to mark your life that way. What God says about you is what matters. Now, at this point, Jesus did have a reputation. He did have a reputation. And guess what? You and I have a reputation too. You and I have a testimony from other people. Now, should we be worried night and day about what people say about us? No. Who's the most important person we should be concerned about? God. What he says about us is important. But here's a question for you, very short, very brief. What's your reputation to those who know you? We're in a digital age, right? We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have all these things. What do your pictures say that you post about your reputation? Can I speak to the ladies for just a minute? Ladies, I'm so happy you found that deal at Forever 21. I'm really happy for you. Two for one, 50%. But just remember, when a guy looks at your picture, he doesn't look at your picture the same way a girl does. Just remember what the Bible says about modesty. Just remember that you can be the one that makes someone trip and fall because of what you're not wearing. The Bible tells us we have a reputation. We have to protect our reputation. Notice what 1 Timothy says. I'm just going to read it to you. Paul's talking to his protege Timothy about leaders in the church, and he says, moreover, talking about leaders, he or they must be well thought of by outsiders so that they may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Some of you guys and gals travel a lot for work. You have to travel. It's not your choice. You just have to travel. Are you going to different places when you travel that you would never go to when you're home? You're in your hotel room. You've got unlimited cable. Sometimes the best thing you can do is not touch the remote. Your reputation matters. We got a call. We were staying at a hotel in Orlando, and we got an extra charge in our bill, and, and I called him. I said, listen, we got this extra charge. He goes, no, you were watching a movie. I said, no, I can guarantee you we weren't watching a movie. We're at the park. Okay, sir, I'll investigate this, Mr. Sanchez, and I'll, if it's not you, you know, don't worry. I'll take it off your bill. 
So apparently someone came into the room, watched the movie while we were not there. Your reputation matters. Before you take your next trip, decide what you're not going to do and where you're not going to go. Because sometimes when you get there, in the excitement and the heat of the moment, you forget. The Bible says we have a reputation. But here's what I want you to know. If God does not define who you are, someone else will. If God does not define who you are, someone else will. I'll never forget this baseball coach I had. He was a professional baseball player. And I didn't know this at the time, but I needed glasses. I was wondering why I was missing the baseball by about that much. I thought it was just personal deficiencies, but I needed glasses. And this coach threw curveballs to my head just to make a point, to not be afraid, to stay in the batter's box. And I remember he said some things that were completely untrue. Just like people have said things about you that are completely untrue. You have to remind yourself, what God says about me is what matters. He is the only one who has the authority to identify who you are and who you are not. Number two, it says, people allow everyone and everything except God to define who they are. Let's go back to the big idea. It says, who God says I am is what matters. Let's say that all together. Ready? One, two, three. Who God says I am is what matters. And that's the truth. Because as we look at this point, people allow everyone and everything except God to define who they are. It's usually not a positive thing. And we've heard it, right? Maybe not to us necessarily directly. We've heard people call other people what? You know, you're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You're slow. You're this. You're that. And listen, that marks people. But it doesn't have to. John 1, he says, this is the testimony of John. So what happened during this time? Let me give you a little bit of context. There was a large governing body of religious leaders called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the religious and political influencers of their day. They were the governing board, and there was a high priest that was over all of them. And then they had two subgroups. One subgroup were the Pharisees, and the other subgroup were the Sadducees. And they had Levites, which were people who would, you know, write down the scripture and copy. And they basically sent these two groups out to ask John this question, who are you? And John was very clear about who he was and who he was not. And he said what? He said, I am not, and he said three people, I am not the who? I am not the Christ. You know, I am not Elias, and I am not the prophet. Christ, Elijah, and the prophet. Now, Luke chapter 3, if you have your Bible. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> and this helps us understand what was happening. Because again, we're going back 2,000 plus years. But this, what was, this is what was happening during that time, Luke chapter 3, verse 15. Just listen. As the people were in expectation of what? Expectation of the revelation of the Messiah. And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this is very interesting because in the Old Testament, 
they did many things that were what we call was a type of. In other words, there were things performed in the Old Testament that resembled future things or foreshadowed future things in the New Testament. For an example, when Moses led the Israelites and they took the Passover, the Passover was a symbol of what was yet to come, which was a type of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when you see the Passover in the Old Testament, that is an incomplete act of a future thing. The future would perfect the past. So all of a sudden, the people of old started looking ahead and saying, who is this Messiah? When is he coming? What do we have to do? So John did the following. He began to baptize people. And here's something you need to know. There was a baptism before Christ, and there was a baptism after Christ and the church. Symbolically, what they would do was this. When somebody was looking ahead to the Messiah and they said, I am going to get my life right in preparation for what was yet to come, then they symbolically would be baptized. They would be immersed in water. They would confess their sins. And that cleansing act, that purification, was symbolic of asking for forgiveness and turning from their sin. So when John was baptizing, they asked him, the you know, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they said, listen, by what authority are you baptizing? Obviously, he was not part of the Sanhedrin. He was not a Pharisee. He was not a Sadducee. He was not a, a Levite. But he was the son of a priest. You remember his name? Zechariah. An angel came and told Zechariah, Zechariah, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah, for a split second or two, did not believe the angel. And he was in the temple of God, and the angel said, you're not going to speak until your son is born. And he came out of the temple, and he could not speak. And later on, John the Baptist was born. But the main challenge that these guys had was this. We have this system of priests and Levites and all of these guys. Who are you? Who are you? And there are times that people will ask you that very same question. Who are you? Who are you? And the question is, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? So, in the book of Deuteronomy... We read, Deuteronomy chapter 18, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like men among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Now, look here at the bottom of your bulletin, Romans 12, 3. And Paul told the church the following, For by the grace given me, I say every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather, think of yourself with what? Sober judgment. Would you underline that phrase, sober? Sober judgment. Why is it so important to be sober? Well, Marcel, I don't want a ticket. That's good. But sober judgment, in other words, have a healthy view of yourself. Now, this is a struggle for our generation. It really is. Why? Because we're the champions of selfies. And I don't know if this is 100% true, but they say that Florida is the number one selfie state. What does that say about us? Yes, we go to the beach more than any other state, but what else does it say? The focus of our attention is us. Marcel, do you do selfies? No, I really don't. My daughter does selfies of me. No. What is happening? What we see here is something very, very interesting. We're going to get to this in a moment. The Bible says 
Be humble. Be humble. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. There's a difference. There's a difference. Now, so we asked the question, who are you? And here's a second one. What do you say about yourself? Notice verse 23 on the left-hand side. Take a look at that. He said, this is John. Now, I don't want you to miss this. John said, I am the voice. Immediately, you have flashbacks to, you know, the voice show and all that. No, no, we're talking about a different voice here, okay? He said, I am the voice. Would you underline that? We're going to talk about this. Of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. Now, let's think about this for just a minute. John was the voice. He didn't identify himself as a prophet. He didn't identify himself as a servant. He simply said, I am the voice. Tremendous humility. But last week we learned that Jesus is what? The Word. So Jesus is the Word. John is the voice. But there's a third leg here. He says, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. How many of you planned your 2015 vacation to go in the middle of the desert and just hang out for a week? Anyone? No one. What do you find in the desert? A lot of sand, a lot of heat, some scorpions every now and again, you know, cactus, you know, cacti, you know, what else do you find? Nothing. There's nothing in the desert. So John was essentially saying, look, Jesus is the word. He's the living word. I am simply the voice. But then the question is, who is the wilderness? If John's the voice and Jesus is the word, who is the wilderness? The wilderness is a type of Israel. John was basically saying, listen, you guys don't understand. The Messiah is right here. And I am simply his voice crying out in the wilderness. What John was telling the people, and he was basically telling them something pretty tough, was, listen, you guys are dry spiritually. You guys are thirsty spiritually. You guys are hungry spiritually. You guys have no hope spiritually, and you're empty spiritually. I cannot fill that void. I am simply the voice telling you who the Word is. That's my job. That's my job. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we in a dry place today? It's happened to us before at work. Set the alarm clock, get in your car, get on the bus, go to work, go to school. Sometimes the week goes by and you're like, wow, it's Friday. Where did the week go? It becomes routine sometimes. It may not challenge you like it did before. But you keep going to work because you've got bills to pay. You have a family to provide for. But what happens when you dry up spiritually? What happens when you come to church because you know God wants us to fellowship, but inside you feel like a desert? John was telling them, listen guys, you are the desert. I'm not the one who can fill what's empty inside. But I am the voice of the word. Now, he says, make straight the way of the Lord. I don't know if you knew this or not, but back in those days when a king was going to travel, 
what they did was they would send out people ahead of time to make sure the road he was traveling on was smooth. I mean, you don't want a king traveling on his, you know, his chariot or the horses, and you've got potholes and all these things on the road. So they sent out a group to go ahead of him and basically repair the road. Now, notice up here in Isaiah 40, this is what John is referring to. He says, and he's quoting Isaiah, a voice cries, this is what Isaiah is saying, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So he's looking ahead at when Christ would come and then when Christ would come again. So you say, okay, Marcel, I get it. Jesus is the word. John is the voice. Israel and those who don't know God are the wilderness. What's my role? I'm not John the Baptist. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I'm not Christ. I hope I'm not in the desert. But what's my role? John was the voice to do what? He was the voice to connect those in the wilderness, those in the desert, to who? To God. To Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever heard a sound, and although you didn't see a picture, or you didn't see an actual object, there was an image immediately that appeared in your mind? And you made a connection with that image. Now, I'm going to play for you a couple, of a, a couple of sounds, and I want you to think of the image. You should be able to identify most, but I want you to think about the image of these sounds. Let's see if we have that. Getting hungry now, huh? Now, how many of you identified at least two or three of the sounds? Okay? Some of you are ready to go fry some bacon. I know that. But here's what I'm trying to say Jesus is the word, John is the voice. The wilderness represents Israel in their spiritual barrenness and dryness. Jesus is still the word. There are still people in dry spiritual places. But God has placed you and I to be the voice. You see, most people don't come to know God because they attend this great evangelistic meeting or stadium gathering. That's 3%, maybe. Most people come to Christ because someone else has made a connection with them and shares with them the gospel. I'll never forget, several years ago, at least 12 years ago, a man called me and said, I'd like to come over to your house and talk to you about divorce. Okay, it's pretty direct. And he said, you know, my wife's not coming, just me, but I want to speak with you regarding divorce. So he came by. And this guy was probably 6'2", you know, 230, 40 pounds, strong guy. And he just sat down and he said, okay, this is what I want to tell you. And this is what my plan. And he goes into this elaborate plan of what he wants to do and how he's going to leave, you know, his wife and all these things. And then I just start talking to him about Jesus. And it surprised me, his reaction. He started crying almost uncontrollably. Now, it wasn't anything that I did. It was simply 
taking the word and being the voice for the word to someone who was in a wilderness. Someone who was dry, someone who was empty, someone who was trying to figure everything out without God in the mix. And I'm happy to say, he's still married. Now, what is your role? It doesn't matter what title you have or you don't have. John was humble enough to say, I am the voice. I am the one that's just crying out to connect people who are in a dry and thirsty place to the Savior, to the King of Kings. Now, as God's voice, and this is what we're talking about, you and I are God's voice. We can boldly speak his word. Because we are God's voice, doesn't matter what title we have or don't have, doesn't depend on our level of education, we are still his voice to fill empty lives with hope. Have you ever seen some of those episodes? And I remember the uh, Extreme Makeover when that first came out. They basically started a new trend in television. Do you remember that? They started and the new trend was you get a big corporate sponsor. In this case was, you know, Sears and I think one or two others. And you find someone who's in a relatively desperate situation. You send them off to go to Disney World for a couple of days, and then you almost, in every situation, you destroy their home, rebuild it in a week or two, and then you bring them back and you surprise them. And most of us, when we watched that show, it was hard not to cry. Because they would take kids and, and parents, and sometimes they were in really tough situations, and the transformation was incredible. Listen, you are not the Word. You are not God. But you are God's voice to those who are spiritually dry. If you are in Christ, you are the voice that God wants to use. Number two, it says, make a new way for the gospel to be heard. I get the opportunity to serve as one of the board of directors for a missions agency that Sam and Corita are part, of, are part of. And they decided that we should have our meeting in January in Kansas City, Missouri, this last week. I don't know if you saw the weather. It was like three degrees, seven degrees, and the wind chill was like negative 10. I had lost my gloves and I didn't have enough time to go buy some. And I got there and one of my fingers was numb. I mean, it was really cold. And I said, you know, guys, we could really go back to Miami and just meet anywhere, you know, Hollywood Beach, South Beach, wherever you guys want to go. But we spent an entire day going through charts and, you know, diagrams and all these things and planning and praying. And there are times that you and I will do things for God. And sometimes we ask ourselves the question, is it worth it? Is it worth my time? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth all of the effort? And the question or the answer is yes. We have amazing platforms today that we did not have 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yesterday, as you know, or many of you know, it was my birthday. And my Facebook account was just ding, 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 ding. And I said, wow. Now, I know that's automatic. People don't have to think about it. It tells them, hey, this guy's, this is his birthday. But you know what? What you and I can post in one single post can really impact people's lives. You and I have a platform today that we didn't have 20 years ago. All I'm saying is, We have to find new ways to help other people know about Jesus Christ. What do you say about yourself, John said, or the Pharisee said? He says, I am not the Christ. Here's a question. What promise from the Bible reminds you of who you are 
in Christ. What promise from the Bible reminds you of this important truth? What promise from the Bible reminds you of God's purpose for your life? You need to have at least one, not 20, not 30, at least one. And here's what God says about us. I'd like you to take a look at the other side of your bulletin for just a minute. And I'm going to read this first section, and then I'm going to ask your help on the second section. So just listen for a minute, and then you, you'll participate with me, okay? I'm going to read the left-hand side for just a minute. It says, I am a saint. I am a child of God. I am reigning with Christ. I am in Christ. I am loved by God. I am complete in Jesus. I am set apart in Christ. I am a new creation. I am a joint heir with Christ. I am a conqueror. I am free in Christ. I am reconciled. I am acceptable to God. I am salt and light. I am redeemed. I am chosen. I am one in Christ. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm going to say I am, and what I'd like you to do is just say the word. So, for example, I'll say I am, and you will say justified. Okay, let's do number two. I am I am, 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 I am. I am, I am, I am, I am. Now, besides all these things, and just listen, I have right now complete satisfaction in Christ, the Holy Spirit, the life or life in God, the mind of Christ, the promises of God, direct access to the Father, eternal security in Christ Jesus, an eternal purpose, a perfect life for me, a perfect life in me. Is that powerful? Yeah, it absolutely is. How many times do we walk around thinking, this is who I am? Listen, no one can put a price tag on your worth. You are priceless. No one can put a value of any kind on how much you mean to God. What God says about you is what matters. Notice the last section here. Does the way you live match your identity? Does the way I'm living this year, are the things that I'm starting to do this year match who I am according to what God says? Notice verse 24 on the left-hand side. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, then, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize you with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So again, they're going back to authority and they're asking the question, John, by whose authority are you doing this? By whose authority? In Matthew 3, John responds and he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am now worthy to carry. Now, what is John telling them? 
John is essentially saying, listen guys, what I am doing is not about me. I'm not trying to be famous. I'm not trying to be on any top 10 list. I'm not doing this to make more money. I'm not doing this to, you know, live in a better house or have a better chariot or have a, a nicer suit. I'm doing this simply because I am the voice. I am the voice. Notice here what he says. He repeats the words of Matthew. And he says in verse 27, Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So here's the first application point. Am I making plans to become famous? Or am I making a way for God to be famous? Here's a question. Are most of your conversations about you and what you like and what you want to do? Marcel, who told you? Nobody told me. But are most of your conversations about you? It's a convicting thought. Think about the plans that you have this next week. Does it center around what I want to do, where I want to eat, where I want to go, where I want to spend my time, what I prefer not to do, what I prefer to do? Does it all revolve around you? Don't make plans to be famous. Make plans for God to be famous. Does my work, number two, point people to Jesus or only to myself? In many circles, whether it's education or in the workplace, people give out awards. Awards of recognition, awards of, you know, hey, Mary, this guy reached this goal or this girl accomplished this. I have a question for you. When someone else gets an award and you don't, are you happy for them? Or does it bother you? Are you the one that stands up and cheers? Or do you kind of cross your arms and say, you know, I work harder than they do. I've been here longer than they have. My hair looks better than hers. <laughs> what do we do? Do we celebrate when others are being lifted up? What do you think John did when people started turning to Jesus? Do you think he got a sign up and said, don't turn to Jesus? I was just kidding. Follow me. At johnthebaptist.com. You know, whatever. No, he didn't do that. He was out there and he said this, and this is very powerful. He must increase and I must decrease. I'll tell you, the problem that we often have with other people is we want to increase and we want them to decrease. It's a selfish thing. It's something that comes from within us. And we all have it. Why did they pull up next to us with a new car? Why was he the first to get the package and get those shoes? Why is her ring three carrots and mine half a tomato? Listen, it's very natural, not supernatural, to envy what other people have. God says, that's not what's important. What you and I have to be willing to do as we think about our career, as we think about what college we're going to go to, as we think about, should I accept this promotion or not? Should I accept this contract or not? Should I have another child or not? Should I move to this location or not? It's simply this. Will this give God an opportunity to increase? Or just me? John said, I'm not the word. You know, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I am simply the voice. 
Does my work point people to Christ? Number three, how much time do I regularly prioritize for God's work? Marcel, I am in church today. Amen. That's great. What about those times that you are not in church? Is God a priority? You know, Marcel, I can't think until I have at least two cups of coffee. I understand. Are you reading the coffee or eating the coffee or drinking the coffee and reading your Bible? This year, and we said this last week and I'll repeat it again, one of the most important things you can do is give God the first 15 minutes of your day. It won't stop there. It'll probably extend to 30. But give God the first 15 minutes of your day. I always laugh at these infomercials. You know, the exercise infomercials, we see them more towards the end of the year and the beginning of the year because they all essentially say the same thing. Listen, all you need is 10 to 15 minutes a day and you will look like this dude here. You know, 18-pack abs. I mean, just, you know, where did they get this guy from? No, it's not going to happen. Listen, if I don't put God first this year, he's not going to be second. He's not going to be third. He'll be like 20 or further down. I've got to put him first. Be on, be on time when you come on Sunday. Be on time to your life group. And do something this year to help someone else grow. Some of you have an encyclopedia of biblical information in your brain. The question is, who are you sharing that with? Have you ever noticed when you download a big software to your computer, what happens? What happens? It slows it down. You know, you download this software because it's the latest and the greatest, but it's a huge program. And they say, well, part of this software has to reside on your computer. What that means is we want you to have the excess load, not us. So you open this software up and all of a sudden your emails are in slow motion, you know, you know everything slows down. If you're only receiving and you're not giving back, you're going to slow down. Because as you give back to others, you grow even more. So it's not just listening and studying and reading God's word. It's finding someone else who you can say, let's get together every other week, every week, or let's just talk on the phone, and let's share from God's word. That's going to do more for your life this year than many other things. And lastly, as we close, do I have a deep respect for God? Do I have a deep respect for God? It's very interesting because during these times when John was around, there was a saying among the religious teachers. And what they said was this. They said, you need to be willing, and I'm paraphrasing, you need to be willing to do anything for your professor, anything for your teacher, except the menial task of taking off his sandal strap and removing his sandal, which would lead to washing his feet. That's what they said. You're supposed to do anything and everything for them except that one thing. Why? Because that job was reserved for someone who they considered less than human. When John appeared on the scene, John said, Jesus is the spoken word. He's the living word. The desert, the wilderness is barren. It's empty. I am the voice. He didn't even say, I am a teacher, I'm a prophet. He simply said, I am the voice. And the way he ended this passage is very powerful. He said, you know, I'm not even worthy to undo the sandal strap 
around his feet. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a deep respect for God? Yeah, Marcel, I pray every day before I eat. With fork and knife in hand? Yeah, I'm ready. Seriously, do you have a deep respect for God? When someone says something that is totally out in left field about God, about church, about your faith, does it really bother you? I remember when I was at the Miami Book Fair and this guy came up to me and tried to describe who God was. God is this mystical, angelic, transcendent, no one can really see him, know him, touch him, smell him. He's out there. You just got to feel him. I said, dude, what are you talking about? That's not who God is. I don't know what you're reading, but that's not who God is. I think I may have offended him. But John had a deep respect for God. He knew what he was doing was so important. Listen. Some of you in the next five to ten years, you're going to do really well in your companies. You might do really well in your business. You might do really well in in education. They may give you an incredible title. Nothing comes even close to being tagged, called God's son, God's daughter. If you are the son and daughter of the king, none of that stuff matters. John said, I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm just a voice. Why? Because people need to hear about Jesus Christ. That's not somebody else's job. If you know Christ, that's our job. Your voice is different than my voice. Your personality is different than the person sitting next to you or behind you. But you have a unique voice. And God has placed you here for such a time as this to help people make the connection, to help people listen to that sound of hope that says, I'm thirsty. That's what I need to drink. I'm empty That's who's going to fill me. I'm hungry. That's what's going to satisfy me. Can you help me know him? So, as we think about today, I want you to just remember this. What God says about me is what matters. Who God says I am is really, really what matters. Let's pray.